Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest making his highly anticipated return to our show is my favorite celebrity biographer. He's written 20 books, 16 of which have made the New York Times bestseller list. His immensely popular biographies about superstars, including Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, Elizabeth Taylor, Carol Burnett, Cher, Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Beyonce are widely considered to be balanced, definitive, and authoritative. He's also written screenplays for television miniseries based on his books, including The Secret Life of Marilyn Monroe and The Kennedys After Camelot. He's written extensively about the Kennedys in his books entitled Jackie, Ethel, Joan, Women of Camelot, After Camelot, A Personal History of the Kennedy Family, 1968 to the Present, Jackie, Janet, and Lee, The Secret Lives of Janet Auchincloss and Her Daughters, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and Lee Radzawill, The Kennedy Heirs, John, Caroline, and the New Generation, A Legacy of Tragedy and Triumph, and now his brand new book entitled Jackie, Public, Private, Secret which has just become his latest New York Times bestseller. In this superbly researched and highly compelling book, we finally get to know the real Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, who was undoubtedly one of the most famous and fascinating women of all time. Our guest pierces through the glamorous, enigmatic, and imperious aura of mystery that has always surrounded this woman, who has become something of a mythological figure. And he reveals not just the intelligent, well-educated, cultured, and beautifully dazzling woman we saw in the media, but more importantly, we get to know Jackie the daughter, sister, wife, mother, grandmother, co-worker, and friend that she was in her real life. I'm delighted to welcome the wonderful J. Randy Terabarelli back to our show. Randy, thank you so much for being here. Ivy, it's great to see you again. Thank you for having me. Randy, you met Jackie in 1983 when she was an editor at Doubleday and you were writing a biography of Diana Ross. You said you were most struck by her trusting nature and that you feel her secret weapon was her basic trust in humanity. What did you mean by that? Well, Harvey, when I met her, she she made you feel as if you could ask her any question and that she would answer it. And there was just something about her trusting nature that made you feel as if you just could not ask her those questions. You know, it's like you would never betray her in that way. She was so open and so available to you that for you to then take advantage of her generosity of spirit by returning her to some terrible dark time in her life was just something that you would not do. And so I felt like that was kind of a secret weapon of hers, you know, her accessibility, her her eagerness to include you made made you not want to take advantage of of her. And I think that that's how she trafficked in in New York City as she lived while she lived there for, you know, 30 years. She would walk out of her home and walk to work without security guards, without anybody protecting her right out into the world. And even though she was always stalked by paparazzi, the New Yorkers did not bother her. You know, it's a, it's as if New Yorkers realized that she was one of their own and they let her be, you know? And I, th- I just think that that's fascinating. They, she trusted that they were not going to harass her and they returned that trust by not harassing her. So, Randy, I've been dying to ask you this question. When Jackie did her White House tour on TV in 1962, she had this soft, whispery voice with an odd kind of upper crust accent. Did she talk like that when you met her? She, however, she didn't sound at all like that. Really? You know, I still have voicemails from, from Jackie from that time. And every now and then I play them for my friends, and they're always amazed because she sounds like a tough New Yorker, you know? <laughs> She sounds like a tough New Yorker. She she didn't have that voice. And, you know, yeah, a lot of people felt that, and I, I think I wrote this in the book, that that voice was more an affectation of nervous energy, of not being comfortable being in the public eye, of, of being anxious about what she was 
supposed to do on TV. And so uh, it, it sort of rose into into her throat and came out in a way that was slightly Marilyn Monroe. If you really, if you really take a listen to 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 that you know, to that tour. In fact, Ethel Kennedy in my book and Bobby Kennedy are trying to figure out, you know, who does she sound like? Who does she sound like? And, and Ethel said, Oh my gosh, she sounds like Marilyn Monroe. Well, you know, of course that would probably be the last person Jackie would want to sound like, but there just was a little bit of a whispery sort of quality to Jackie's voice when she was in the public eye that well, was kind of reminiscent of Marilyn. If you're a coffee lover like me, it's always fun to discover a great new blend. I recently found a terrific new company, Breakfast at Dominique's, that's created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of the greatest Hollywood legends. And I'm thrilled to tell you that now, Breakfast at Dominique's has introduced the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend. It's my very own exclusive, delicious, bold, rich, balanced, medium roast coffee, and I just know you're going to love it. It's made from high quality organic beans produced using fair trade practices. If you'd like a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try and order the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend at hollywoodblends.com. They'll ship it right to your door anywhere in the world. Sipping our coffee is the perfect way to watch our show. Yeah, it was. Jackie said to you, Randy, like it or not, a person's secrets are what makes any biography worthwhile. Now, that's incredibly ironic because she was renowned for going to great lengths to protect her privacy. In fact, before she died, she burned stacks of correspondence she'd received from family and friends. How difficult was it for you to uncover Jackie's secrets? I have to say that what was more difficult for me was making sure that what I was writing in this book had not been written before in the hundreds of other books about Jackie, including my own. You know, there were many times when I would come up with a revelation or my one of my researchers or Kathy Griffin, my chief researcher, would come up with a story and I would it would sound familiar to me. You know, I mean, I've been writing about the Kennedys for 30 years and and it would sound familiar to me. And I would be like, did I write that? Did we already write that? You know, and I go back to one of my early books and there it would be, you know, and then I would not use it in this book. So for me, the challenge with this book wasn't so much uncovering information. It was making sure that this book stood alone, uh, 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 separate and apart from my four other Kennedy books. And I think that it does. I think that's the reason why it's been successful. I think maybe at first blush, a person might think, well, there's just nothing else to be said, you know. But I think that even after they read the first maybe 20 pages of this book, they realize that this is not going to be the same material and that I definitely am uncovering new ground. Well, you've just hit on something very significant. You've now written five books about the Kennedys, and you spent three years writing this book, if I'm not mistaken. Where does your fascination with the Kennedys come from? I am fascinated by families. You know, I mean, most of my books are about families. You know, when I did Grace and Steel, it was about the Bush family. My Michael Jackson book is really about the Jackson family as much as it is about Michael. And when I wrote Marilyn Monroe, it was about her relationship with her mother. And the Hiltons is a family story as well. And, the, and, and what better family than the Kennedys in terms of human drama? And, uh, and also, oddly, there's a relatability to, to what they've gone through. And, and I tried to uncover that sort of human element of Jackie with this new book. And, and I try to explain to people that, she, that that even though you might feel that she, this, this is not a woman you could ever relate to because she's Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and what can I possibly have in common with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis? I think when you read the book, you realize that you have a lot in common with her. You know, that she, if, if you've ever dealt with a parent who has Alzheimer's, you have that in common with her. If you've ever had you know, a PTSD in your life from a traumatic event. You have that in common with her. You know, I mean, you, you, her story is, 
so human and the Kennedy stories are so human and not what you would expect of an iconic family that I just really sort of love exploring that humanity in my books. Have you had any communication with her daughter, Caroline? No, I have not. I have not had, had, of course, I I sent her a book and I'm hoping that she, you know, she reads it, but I send her all of my Kennedy books, Uh, but I have never had any, uh, uh, I've never had any sort of obstruction from Caroline at all. I've never had any problems with the Kennedys. My books are available at the JFK Library and Museum for purchase, which I think says a lot about, you know, sort of the respectability of my Kennedy books. And the credibility. Thank you. I, I, I like to think so. Yeah, thank you. Now, as we all know, Randy, Jackie endured a lot of stress during her marriage to President Kennedy because she was well aware of his chronic infidelity. Legend has it that JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, offered Jackie $100,000 to stay married to JFK and have a baby. Do you know if she ever agreed to that and took the money? I I do know in, in this book, we report I guess for the first time that she did make that agreement with with Joseph and that he did deposit that money into her account upon the birth of uh, her first child, uh, Caroline. You know, that Janet, ja- Janet often lost Jackie's mother was against that that deal. She was worried because Joseph Kennedy said it had to be upon, the, you know, the completion of a successful birth, which is a very sort of callous way of putting things because Jackie had had, you know, a stillbirth prior to that moment. The reason that Joseph Kennedy made that deal was to keep her in the marriage. It wasn't really about the, the, the birth of, of the child as much as it was keeping her in the marriage, because after the stillbirth of Arabella, when JFK did not come back to be at Jackie's side, he chose to be on a cruise instead. Jackie was pretty done with the marriage. She said that she didn't want to be married to him anymore. And Janet, her mother, firmly agreed that they they should divorce. This was back in the 50s. And Jackie confided in Ethel Kennedy, her sister-in-law, that she was thinking about leaving JFK. Ethel, a true Kennedy loyalist, went right to Joseph Kennedy and told him. And that's when Joseph made that offer. And Jackie decided to take, take the offer, yes. When Jackie's brother, Jamie, was asked why Jackie put up with her husband's infidelity, he said, because she was bred for it. What do you think he meant by that comment? I, I, I you know, it's interesting because I, I, I in many ways, uh, she was not bred for it. I know what he what he was saying, because his mother put up with the infidelity of her husband, Jack Bouvier who was Jackie's father. So in that sense, I understand that she was bred for it because there was a history in the family of putting up with this. But in another sense, maybe not, because Janet did not believe in infidelity and neither did Jackie. It's not as it, it's not as if they endorsed it. You know, they both felt that it was wrong. And, and Jackie put up with it because she loved JFK. And Janet was very unhappy with JFK through through much of the marriage and felt responsible for Jackie's heartbreak since Janet had so endorsed JFK as a husband and put her trust in JFK. And when he let down her daughter with, he did not mess with Janet's daughter, you know, I mean, she was fiercely protective of her children and she felt let down by JFK. So even though they were, bre- she, Jackie was bred for it in the sense that her mom had the same relationship with her father, neither Jackie nor Janet were eager to accept JFK's infidelity. Now, regarding JFK's infamous relationship with Marilyn Monroe, you finally clarified that they had only one weekend together. There was no long affair. And when Marilyn sang at JFK's 45th birthday party at Madison Square Garden, Jackie did not attend. Did you ever find out why? Well, in this book, I report for the first time 
really why. We all knew that she wasn't there. And and if you can think, if you put this in today's terms, imagine if Joe Biden was having a big birthday celebration at Madison Square Garden and Jill decided not to attend. That would be, you know, quite a big deal. You yeah. Know, and this was this is what happened. You know, Jackie didn't go primarily because she knew that Marilyn Monroe was going to be performing the happy birthday song. And she just didn't approve of Marilyn. And she didn't approve of the way she felt that Marilyn was being toyed with by JFK. I think it overstates it to say that she was uh, 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 upset about the affair because even though we now know that it was just a weekend, we don't know how much Jackie knew about it. We don't know if she thought it was a protracted affair, if she thought it was just a weekend. We don't really know. But what we do know is that she didn't she felt that Marilyn was very vulnerable, very fragile, and that she didn't have what it would what, what it took to deal with a powerful personality like Jack Kennedy, or as was rumored, Bobby Kennedy. And she just did not want to endorse it. She didn't want to sit in the audience and applaud while Marilyn was being exploited by JFK and Bobby and anybody else who decided to put her in that position of singing happy birthday to him after he had decided to no longer see her. You know, that's what is interesting about the the birthday thing is that that was after Marilyn had tried to reconnect with JFK and he did not want to have anything to do with her, yet he put her in that position. So it's a complicated story. I tried to explain it in the book. And I think that when you read the book, you get a full picture. Yes, for sure. There's another interesting quote in the book from Jackie's brother, Jamie. He described her relationship with JFK as one of mixed messages. Do you think she loved him a lot more after he died than when they were together? Is that a silly question? No, it's not a silly question. You know, it's funny because she told her therapist, Marianne Chris, in the 1970s, when she was dealing with the PTSD over JFK's death, you know, that she said he went out on a blaze of glory, which made it impossible for me to hate him. And and I think that what she meant by that was she was entitled to her mixed emotions about him based on the marriage that they had, based on what he put her through. But when you, you know, when your husband is assassinated like that, you suddenly feel guilty about having any kind of emotion at all, except for sadness. And part of Jackie's PTSD that she dealt with for her entire life, all the way to the very end, was had to do with unpacking all of these mixed emotions about her husband. She loved him. You know, there are letters in my book from her to him that show how much she loved him. And I think that if she didn't love him so much, the infidelity wouldn't have hurt as much as it did. And 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 it's also interesting that at toward the end of his life, he decided to give up the other women. You know, after the death of their baby Patrick, JFK made a big turn in his life and he 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 decided to recommit himself to his marriage and also recommit himself to Jackie's side of the family, to the Auchincloss's. And so much so that he was building, he had decided to build a home next door to the Auckland Clauses estate so that they could all be together finally as a family. And then he was he was killed. So that wasn't able to happen. But I often wonder, and I talked to Jamie about this, what would it have been like if he had lived, you know, and they would have been able to finally be a real family without all of the, the intrusion of these other women. How wonderful would that have been? Yeah, it really would have been wonderful. And I don't think anybody can blame her if she idealized the marriage after he died. Now, one of the most shocking revelations in your book is that right after JFK was assassinated, Aristotle Onassis flew to Washington and stayed at the White House, and he walked into Jackie's bedroom uninvited the night before the funeral. Now, that raises two obvious questions. The first one is, how in the world did you find out about this? Well, you know, I have my sources. You know, what can I what can I tell you? You know, it's a, it's a it's an interesting story that I think has never been reported. Basically, what happened was Onassis called Jackie 
one day, uh, right, right the day after the assassination, and said he was in Washington uh, to pay his respects. And he was staying at the Viking Hotel in Washington. And she said, no, that's just terrible. You can't stay there. You have to come here to the White House. And after she hung up, she realized that there was no room at the White House for anybody. You know, the White House was filled with dignitaries and different people, relatives, and there was no room for Onassis, who was an uninvited guest. And so she put him up in, in, the, in the servants' quarters in a small sitting room that just had a black and white TV and not even a bed, which is so interesting and fascinating because he's the w richest man in the world and he's sort of banished to the, to the servants' quarters. But she wasn't expecting him. I asked Jamie, Jackie's half-brother, you know, what, what's his take on, on this? And Jamie felt that Onassis had gotten mixed messages from Jackie on a recent cruise that he hosted for her and Lee. Uh, he and Jackie got along famously on this cruise, which was just a couple of months before JFK's death. And uh, Jamie felt that Onassis thought maybe there might be something between them. And there really wasn't at that time. Later on, of course, they would end up married, which is interesting as well. But at that time, in 1963, there wasn't anything. He was seen going into Jackie's room. But I also have to say that right before he went in, Jackie was given uh, me medication by her doctor that was designed to put her out cold. And so we have to we have to assume that nothing happened. You know, the, probably knowing Jackie, she probably just, you know, told him that she she's tired and he has to go. And believe me, if anything did happen, we would know about it because Onassis would have said like he was not the kind of person to be discreet if he had had anything with Jackie that night. It's just beyond belief that he would have because she was in such grief. But if anything had happened, we would have known about it. It wouldn't have taken me in this book to reveal it, you know. Well, that was going to be my next question. Do you know what transpired in Jackie's bedroom that night? I'm just shocked that Onassis had the audacity to enter her bedroom uninvited when it's well known that she was grief stricken and highly medicated at that time. It just speaks volumes about this man's personality. <laughs> well, look, I, he, he, he was a colorful personality, that's for sure. But, Harvey, I think people get a different, as the story rolls on and the years roll by in my book i think you become more sympathetic to onassis you know when he you know suffers from a terrible nerve disease and in my book he goes to visit janet and hugh at hammersmith farm and you know he and janet had never been warm but he told her you know, that he he admired the way that she raised her daughters and he wished that he had the same relationship with his children. And her heart went out to him because he was suffering so much at that time with this nerve disease that he couldn't keep his eyes open. And Jackie would have to tape his eyes open with Band-Aids and then put sunglasses on him so that he wouldn't be embarrassed. And in that last meeting with Janet Offenkloss, she gave him a rosary that had been blessed by the Pope and told him, you know, that she would visit him on Scorpio. And she had made a decision when he married Jackie many years earlier that she would never go to Scorpio's to visit him. But she changed her mind about him. You know, and I think that's I think that nobody is one thing. And throughout, you know, uh, people always ask, ask me, what was Onassis like? It just depends when you found him, you know, just as it does all of us. I mean, I think the one thing we often comment is that we're not one thing, you know, that we have moments that maybe aren't, we're not at our best self. Then we grow up and then we're something else. And then 10 more years pass and we're something else, you know, and maybe the Onassis who, who felt that he was able to visit Jackie that terrible night in the White House was not the same man five years later when he was with Janet at Hammersmith. You know, I think people change and you have to give them a chance to do that. And I try to do that in my books. I try to make sure that there are no villains in my stories, that people have a chance to be something else if they decide to take that chance. And Onassis, I think, eventually did decide to take that chance, you know? He and Hugh Auchincloss became friends. 
you know, they have a lot in common. And and there's a story in the book of he and Janet going off and joy riding in one of her cars. You know, a very uninteresting portrait of Onassis in this book, which I think is nothing like what people have ever heard about Onassis. Well, that's the genius of a Randy Terraborelli book, is that you do make these people three-dimensional. You really do give us a chance to see the whole person and not just the public image. Now, obviously, when JFK was murdered, Jackie Kennedy didn't just lose her husband. She lost her identity as America's first lady. I learned from your book, Randy, that a short time after the assassination, President Lyndon Johnson offered to make Jackie the ambassador to Mexico, but she turned it down. Do you think it might have been good for her to accept the position? Well, it's the first time anyone's ever brought that up. Uh, I almost forgot that was in the book because no one's ever mentioned it. Leave it to me. (laughs) To you. I just think it's so interesting. You know, he was kind of trying to use her. You know, and I think that she got that. I mean, I I, I I love Lyndon Johnson in this book, especially because he's a flirt and he's funny. And I Jackie really liked Lyndon Johnson. I think you'll get that from this book. But everybody knew that he was trying to use her because she was America's widow as much as she didn't want to be. She said she did not want to be America's widow. That was her quote. And but she was. And Lyndon Johnson just wanted to find something he could do to sort of exploit her. And I think she knew that, I mean, it was such an odd request that I think that she realized that that is what's going on here. And that's why she turned him down, you know. I, I, I think she may have made a mistake, you know. I don't think she would have needed the whole Onassis chapter if she could have reinvented herself in that way. But what do I know? Well, that's interesting that you feel that way because that that's what I love about books is I do shows like yours where somebody like you will say something like that that is like completely valid and makes all the sense in the world, but I didn't come up with it, you know? And if I had come up with that, I might have put that out there as a, you know, maybe she should have because if she had, just just exactly what you said. And I love that people can read my books and come up with ideas and conclusions that I didn't come up with. And it just makes me so happy to know that people are thinking about these characters in a, in a way that makes them think, you know? That, what you just said, is absolutely true. Uh, I could kick myself for not thinking about it that way because that might have changed Everything. If she had taken that, it might have given her an identity that might have changed the course of her life, you know. So thank you for that. And <laughs> and it happens with you, especially you always come up with a thing that makes me just say, whoa, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> well, thank you, Randy. You know, I love you and I love your book so much. It just I can't help it. Now, many people feel that the definitive book about President Kennedy's assassination is The Death of a President by William Manchester. Jackie insisted that about 1,600 words be taken out of the manuscript before it was published. Do you know what it was that she wanted taken out? I do. You know, she felt like, well, you know, she gave a lot of interviews to William Manchester and she was just feeling feeling very betrayed by that book. The thing, the, the, the moments that she wanted taken out might se- have seemed innocuous to even William Manchester. It had to do with, for instance, you know, she had Caroline, her daughter Caroline, you know, write a, a, a few words on in a note that she then put into the casket. And she told William Manchester what the note was and what Caroline had written. And he put it in the in, in the manuscript. And she didn't, she felt like that was just not fair to Caroline, who was just a little girl. And she wanted that out. Many people considering what was in that book, it's an explosive, as I wrote, fantastic book. I mean, if you want the definitive book about JFK's assassination. Death of a president is it. There, there, there are others, but that's the one, right? And 
And it's like, it's a huge, gigantic book. And so for this little, for these 1600 words about what Caroline wrote to her daddy and, and Jackie put into the casket, it would seem to be nothing, you know, but it was important to Jackie. And and so 1600 words is not a lot of words, by the way. I mean, that's not a lot. But this book is about 500,000 words, you know. Seriously, it really is. But it just shows you that you never know what is going to What's going to hit a person, you know, like I have this on my mind all the time, especially with, when I write when I write a book about somebody that I actually had an interaction with. You know, like when I wrote this book, I, I could see Jackie sitting across from me open and leaning in and making me feel like I was the most important person in that moment in her life. And you have that image in your head. And so everything that you write is weighed by how she's going to feel about this. And there were moments, there were times when I decided not to include certain passages myself in the because I thought, you know what, this goes just a little bit too far into invading her privacy. And even though my job as a biographer is to invade the privacy of my subjects, I have to find a place where I just think it goes too far. And it has to do with how I was raised. It has to do with my perception of the person I'm writing about has to do with the memory of that person looking at me when I was a young kid writing my very first book. That's, that was my experience with Jackie. And, and you sort of measure as a biographer, what it is that you can live with. Right. And there were moments in this book that I, I decided not to go with, even after the book was typeset. Like I would, after it was typeset and I read it and I, would, and I would thought, I'm not sure how I feel about that. And a lot of times, Harvey, it's not even an anecdote. It's a sentence. You know, like a lot of times it's just a sentence. It might be just three or four words that I'm think that I think, you know, we don't need those three words. You know, like sometimes I am up at night in bed thinking about those three words. Right. And thinking. Oh, those three words are such great words, first of all, because all my words are great. Right? <laughs> I feel like everything I write, everything I come up with is just great. And I can't live without those three words because they're just so great. But in the end, I will take out those three words because I just feel like it's not fair to her. And there were a lot of instances in this book where those three words didn't make it. Well, I think it to me, what makes you so special, besides the depth of your research, is integrity and respect. That's what comes through in the fact that you will labor and torture yourself over three words because you want to be fair. Now, it's certainly no surprise that Jackie suffered from PTSD as a result of the assassination. How do you think her PTSD affected the choices that she made in her life? Well, I think, uh, I know that her mom, Janet, and her stepfather, Hugh, felt that she was not in her right mind when she married Onassis. That she was suffering from PTSD, not only because of what happened to Jack, but Bobby Kennedy had just been assassinated. Just in you know right before she married Onassis and Jackie said if they're coming after Kennedy's they're coming after my children my children are next and she knew that she needed to do something to protect herself and she married Onassis and Jackie Janet and Hugh felt that she was not in her right mind and they they you know Janet did not endorse the marriage Hugh felt like if this is what she wants to do then we have to let her do it you know, he didn't come out against Onassis like Janet did. And I think many of the decisions that she made, I think that when you have PTSD, you, it informs your entire life. And, you know, Jackie said, it's, it's quoted in my book, is telling John Warnicke, the architect who designed the JFK grave site at Arlington, and the, with whom she had a three-year relationship, and they remained friends for her entire life. At the end of her life, he asked if she had any regrets. And she said that her one regret was that she had allowed the Kennedy assassination to poison the rest of her life. 
and that she never was able to get over it. She got past it, she said, but she could never get over it. But true to her surviving, her survival instinct, I guess it is, and true to who she was as a woman, she told John that she felt that if she had just 10 more years, that she'd be able to wrestle all of that into submission. And she had been dealing with it for 30 years by this time. And how amazing is it that she felt that if she just had 10 more years, she'd be able to do it. And what a tragedy she didn't get it. Given that you've just mentioned Bobby Kennedy, there were so many rumors constantly about Jackie and Bobby Kennedy having an affair, but you're quite certain that they did not have an affair, correct? I'm quite certain that they did not have an affair because that just isn't who they were as people. You know, I mean, those rumors, you have to, you have to think, how is it possible that a woman like Jackie, who is so grief stricken, and a man like Bobby, who is so grief stricken, would then jump into bed and have sex with each other? I mean, it, you know, I think that these rumors start because people don't understand that these are real people. These are real people. You know, these aren't cartoon characters. These aren't, you know, these aren't, these aren't people in, in some kind of weird reality TV show. You know, these are real people who were suffering. And plus, Jackie would never have done it because she wouldn't have done it to Ethel. You know, she just would, she just was not that, that person who would have done that to, to, to her sister-in-law. So I did, you know, I mean, look, I approached it with an open mind and did all the research I could to find out. Maybe it was true. Who knows? You know, and then in the end, I, I, I was just convinced that this just did not happen. But I want to say this, and this is in the book. Ethel wasn't sure what to think, because these weren't just rumors that were floating around out, outside. They were happening in the family. Like there were people who were wondering about this because Bobby and Jackie were very, very close. Their grief made them even closer and there were people in the family who were like wait a second what's going on here what you know and ethel had heard these rumors and she started to wonder herself well i i just don't know what to think well as i wrote in the book they were at a party together and ethel looked across the room and she and jackie made eye contact and in that one single moment ethel knew it wasn't true you know in just that one single moment of kind of looking into Jackie's soul from across the room, she knew it wasn't true. And that was the end of it. It was never brought up again. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that once and for all. Now, you've made it pretty clear that in the years following the assassination, Jackie became quite obsessed with achieving financial security for herself and for her children. When someone told her that money doesn't buy happiness, she answered, Anyone who says that doesn't know where to shop. And Jackie's mother always said that the key to happily ever after is money and power. You described her marriage to Onassis as transactional, and I think that's pretty obvious. Do you think that Jackie was overly materialistic? I think this. Janet married Hugh Auchincloss because Jack Bouvier didn't leave her with any money. Right. And she needed to, she needed to find a way to support her two children, and that's why she married Hugh Auchincloss. Not to say that they didn't love each other, because Jamie, Hugh, and Janet's son believes that they did love each other. But there was a transactional nature to their to their marriage. And then Hugh became Jan, Jackie's stepfather, and Jackie moved into Hugh's estate when she was thirteen, and they became very close, and she loved him very much. So there, so there wasn't like a bitterness to this transaction. It, it worked. And I think that when J JFK died and Jackie was left not with a lot of money, and then when Janet's father died, they thought that maybe Jackie would get some money from him, and she, there was none given to her. And Hugh Auchincloss's money was going to his natural children, to Jamie and, and his sister and, and their siblings, and not to Jackie and Lee. What was Jackie supposed to do, especially given the fact that she was raised to believe that the, as you said, the secret to happily ever after was money and power. She had neither. After JFK was gone, she had no money and she had no power. 
right? So she dated Jack Warnicky, John Warnicky, who I interviewed, wonderful man. They were together for three years. But then when he confided in her that he was a million dollars in debt, she just knew that that wasn't going to work for her, especially after Janet made it clear that if you marry him, his debt will be your debt. Not only do you not have any money, but now you're going to be a million dollars in debt. These were practical women trying to come up with practical solutions to to financial situations. And basically, you know, Onassis came to the table with a lot of money. And Janet, Jackie realized that, you know, she was going, she, she decided to marry him for the same reason her mom married Hugh Auchincloss for financial security. Plus, Onassis also offered her a huge army of, of protection at a time when Jackie was worried about her, her safety and the safety of her children because of Bobby Kennedy's assassination. So it kind of made sense, you know, that she would bring Onassis in, into her life in that way. You know, a lot of people didn't think it did because Jackie was by marriage a Kennedy and her children were Kennedys and the Kennedys had money. But what did we see? We saw Rose Kennedy, the matriarch of the family, approving of Jackie's marriage to Onassis. Personally, I think it was because she knew that if Jackie married Onassis, the Kennedys wouldn't have to support her financially anymore because Rose didn't even go to the wedding. So there was an option. There was the Kennedy money. And obviously, Jackie didn't think that was going to be forthcoming. Well, it wasn't forthcoming. That's the problem. You know, look, the Kennedys, it had been five years since JFK's death and they put her on a, on a, on a budget and she, and Bobby Kennedy raised the amount a little bit, you know, but it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't uh, like, it wasn't a lot. It was enough to keep her going. And, you know, there, there are stories in the book. I mean, look, I paint a pretty good picture of this time in her book. She had a ledger and every single dime, as you read in the book, she would account for you know, how much, you know, $200 is going here, $100 for this, hundred, and, and, and making it worse, she was terrible at budgeting and she had extravagant taste. Like she didn't, she didn't, she wasn't like a sensible person when no. it came to spending money. You know, so yeah, she would spend 50 cents on this and she'd write it down. And then she spent $100,000 on some crazy bust in her, in her house and, that she didn't even really like, you know, so she, she wasn't raised to care about these things. But then when she finally had to care about them, she didn't know how to, you know? And uh, Onassis was a really easy and good solution for her. And wow, if she had not married him, who knows how her life would have turned out because she, when he died, she became very, very wealthy. And then she lived her life after that, a wealthy woman. Look what happened to Lee, Lee, her sister, had to pinch pennies until she was in her 60s, you know, and because she she was never able to figure out a way forward for herself or her two children. So she was always, you know, she had, she was an interior designer. She was writing a book. She was, you know, she was a, a model. You know, she was doing this. She was doing that. Like she, Lee had like all, every year she had a different career because she was trying to figure out a way to make money. These were not wealthy women. As much as we think of them in, this, in that way, the, the truth of it is that they were always trying to figure out a way forward financially. Well, Jackie's marriage to Onassis ended when he died in 1974. And as you point out, she then became very wealthy. But you suggest in your book that if Onassis had not gotten sick and died, he most likely would have divorced Jackie. Tell us why. Well, first of all, when he made when he was making the decision to divorce Jackie, I don't think he was in his right mind. You know, I mean, he was he was sick and he was he, he was angry because it didn't seem like he got as much out of the marriage as Jackie got. You know, they, they made it they made a deal, basically, you know, that he could have his life with Maria Callas and that she would be able to have a life of her own. She didn't have affairs, but he did. And she became, you know, Jacqueline Onassis, and, you know, she was like having a having a good life and a good time in New York. And he just felt like 
he got sort of the raw end of that deal, you know. And when he decided to, he was going to divorce her, I actually think she would have gotten more money if he had divorced her than he did, than she did after his death, because she had to really fight Christina, his daughter, for the money that she got at his death. I mean, she had to fight for it. And if they had gotten divorced, Onassis was, he was not a cheapskate. He would have probably given her a lot. And so who knows how things might have worked out. I mean, he was probably going to give her, you know, the island and, you know, the, the Christina, the, the yacht and who knows what else. And she, she wouldn't have had to fight for it as she did have to fight for it when he died. Well, good point. Good point there. You wrote quite extensively about Jackie's rather complicated and at times rivalrous relationship with her sister, Lee Razawil. They competed for the same men more than once, and Jackie always ended up winning. Did you draw any conclusions about Jackie from the way she treated her sister? Well, I think that it was a very complex relationship. There was There's a point in my book when after uh, Lee's husband, Prince, dies, uh, Jackie decides that she wants to help Lee and she gives her a huge amount of money, probably with the equivalent of maybe a million and a half dollars would be today, maybe two million. And Lee just was like, I just, you know, feel like she's giving it to me out of guilt. But she did take it. You know, she did take it. Jackie tried to reach out to Lee, but Lee carried with her so many years of envy and righteous indignation and sadness because I think that she couldn't help but wonder what her life would have been like if her mom had just stayed out of it because it was really her Jackie's mom and Lee's mom, Janet, who decided that Jackie should be with JFK. JFK was interested in Lee and not Jackie. And Jackie was fine with that. You know, it's a funny thing about this competition and rivalry. Jackie didn't really participate in it. You know, it was it was more like Lee always getting like the short end of the stick because of circumstances. And because of her mom, Janet, the mom, decided that Lee, who was about 19, did not need to worry about getting a husband just quite yet. Jackie, who was like 23, I think should have been settled by now in Janet's mind. Women at that time in the 50s needed to get settled. And the one, the only way you got settled was to get married and have children. Then you were settled and you don't have to worry about you anymore. Now I'll worry about this one. You know, so that she, Janet figured, let's just get Jackie settled with JFK. After that's over, then we'll figure out what to do about Lee. So Janet pushed Jackie toward JFK and Lee ended up not marrying JFK, obviously. And you have to wonder if I wonder it, and I'm sure you wonder it. You know, Lee was wondering what my life would have been like if I had been the one to marry JFK. My mom had just kept her nose out of it. Lee might have ended up being first lady. Lee could have ended up with Jackie's life. Who knows? And that's why that chapter in my book is called What If? You know, then cut to, you know, uh, 15 years later, and Onassis is somebody that Lee had had a, an affair with that Janet did not approve of because Janet did not approve of affairs and Lee was married. And Onassis ended up with Jackie, you know, because basically because Janet insisted that Lee reaffirm her marriage vows in the Catholic church and end it with Onassis. And so Lee did that. And then Onassis ended up with Jackie. It wasn't like Jackie stole Onassis. It wasn't like Jan, like Lee and Onassis had this uh, affair that everybody uh, knew about and they were together and they were both single and they were, you know, it wasn't like that at all. Lee broke up with Onassis and then Jackie ended up with Onassis. But still, that had to hurt. You know, that had to hurt Lee. And it did hurt Lee. And I want to also say, not that I want to just go on and on about this, but it was Lee's decision in 1968 to make sure that Jackie had Onassis because Lee was concerned that if somebody went after Jackie and the children 
and managed to get to them because she had prevented Jackie from being with Onassis. If she had prevented Jackie from having the protection that Onassis provided, how was Lee going to live with herself? Right. And so she told Jackie, you can have them. And Jackie took them. So it's complicated, man. And these siblings, sisters are a mess. I'm telling you. I mean, so are brothers, by the way. These, you know, these mothers and children and mothers and daughters and, you know, all this stuff is a mess. And when you're a guy like me trying to unpack it all for, you know, 30 years later, it can, it can, in this case, like 50 years later, it can really be difficult. And I try to prevent it. I try to present as much of both sides as I can so that people really understand why these decisions were made. And that's one more reason why your books are so relatable, because you make us see that they are real people. And many of the family dynamics that everyone goes through happen to them, too. Now, there's not a lot of detail in the book about Jackie's relationship with her kids when they were growing up. Do you think she was a good mother? It's interesting that you mentioned that. No one else has mentioned that. And that that was by design, because I'll tell you why. Everybody knows Jackie was a good mother, you know. And I could have written chapter and verse about her relationship with her children, but it would not have said anything more than she was a good mother. And I just wanted this book to be different. I didn't want this book to be a repeat repeating things that we already know. And so there are moments in the book where you feel the, the, that she was a good mother because I remember there's a moment in the book where she and Carolyn are, uh, Caroline are painting their nails while, while watching TV together. And I thought that's an interesting moment. I tried to show moments of, you know, the, these, of her relationship with her children, but I didn't want to write a bunch of chapters about, about how good of a mother she was. I just felt like we all know that Jackie was a good mother and, I wanted this book to be about more than what we already know. But yes, to answer your question, I think she was a good mother. There are people who disagree with that. You know, I remember Maud Shaw, the nanny who was hired, who actually had the temerity to tell Jackie, I think you should be, you know, a better mother to your, your children because you're off, you know, who knows where, and I'm taking care of your kids, right? Well, I'm sure that didn't go over well with Jackie. In fact, Jackie ended up firing her. You know, there is a point in the book in 1966, I think, where they all go to a trip. To, they all go to England together. And Maud doesn't realize that she ain't coming back. And she, <laughs> Jackie is like, no, you stay here and we're going back. Right. And, and, and Maud, you know, then Maud wrote a book called White House Nanny. And Jackie was, infuriated by this breach of trust that she would write a book about her children, about Jackie's children. And she really did not want Maude to have anything more to do with the children after that. So it's complicated. But yeah, I definitely believe that Jackie was a good mother. I asked you that question, Randy, because I've sometimes wondered whether Caroline may at some point when she was growing up have trouble measuring up to the standards that Jackie set in terms of beauty, glamour, public image. It cannot have been easy to be Jackie Kennedy Onassis's daughter. You're right. And, and, and I think that I use a line in the book from Caroline who says it was very hard living up to the Jackie o Kennedy Onassis, you know, measurement of, uh, of, of, beauty and of success and, of, of, and of, of everything. You know, Jackie wanted a life for Caroline that would be fun and exciting, like the life that she had. And when J Caroline came to her with Ed, Ed Schlossberg, and said she wanted to marry this guy, Jackie was like, you know, he lives in New York. He's, I don't know what he is. Is he an architect? Is he a He's a scholar. I'm not sure what he does. You know, he's he's not outgoing. He's not fun. She's I don't want you to live your whole life in the suburbs of New York. I want you to have a life like I had. I want you to go to Greece. I want you to meet a, meet a rich, exciting Greek mogul and have cruises and have men falling all over you. And I want you to be rich and, and have fun. And, you know, and 
Janet is the one who told Jackie, look, she's not going to have your life. You have to let her have her life. And I think that that is so true of mothers and daughters, you know, and sometimes it takes the grandmother to intervene and say, wait a minute, that was what you did. And by the way, Janet said, you're romanticizing it. You weren't that happy, right? Janet told her, look, I know you weren't happy with Jack. You weren't happy with Onassis. It might seem now years later that you were, but I was there and you weren't. You know, so so this thing that you want for your daughter, you're romanticizing. Let her have her life. And that's what ultimately happened. But I love that story so much because that's mothers and daughters right there. You know, mothers want their daughters to have a big, fantastic, beautiful life. And if, it, and if the daughter comes home with somebody who seems like a bit of a nerd, sometimes the mom is like, I don't think he's for you. Do you think Jackie cared about her public image in the years after the assassination? Uh, I, I don't. It's funny because it's funny you asked that question because in 1975, I think, Jackie was, you know, seen with Frank Sinatra. She was courting Frank Sinatra for to, to write his memoir for Viking Press. Jackie was an editor at Viking at that time. And she was going out with Sinatra, kind of dating him, kind of trying to, you know, not having sex with him, but, you know, kind of trying to get him to trust her enough that she could edit his autobiography because she really wanted to do this. And Ethel Kennedy was outraged by this because, you know, Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack and who knows what Frank and JFK had up their sleeve. And everybody thought that Frank Sinatra was a poor influence on JFK. Even Jackie thought that. And Ethel Kennedy called Jackie and said, how could you even go out with this man? Do you realize what people are saying about you? Do you know what people are going to be saying? And Jackie said, you know what? After what I've been through, I don't care what people say about me. Like after I married Onassis, I gave up think, caring about what people think. And Jackie had a really good line when JFK was assassinated. She said, you know, he's now a legend when he would just as soon have been a man. And that's true of Jackie, too. You know, she became a legend after JFK's assassination when she just wanted to be a woman and she just wanted to live her life. And she didn't care what people thought. She, you know, it's, it's, it's a cool thing when you think about it, you know, I mean, she was raised to, to care, you know, Janet was really about caring what people thought, you know? So for Jack, for Jackie to not care, I think that after the assassination, she just didn't care what people thought anymore. And I love that about her. And that, that's the way we should live our lives. If you really think about it, we, we, we can't care we, about people's judgment. You know, Jackie cared that people were treated well. She certainly treated me well in my you know, few moments with her. Like she treated people well. She wanted people to like her, just as we all do. But what she didn't want was to have to live by their judgment of her. And in that respect, I think that she, that's what we can all kind of learn from Jackie. No matter, no matter what the circumstances, you got to not care what people think. You have to live your life. Oh, I love the fact that you said that because everybody here raised an eyebrow when I left the judiciary at the young age of 65, mind you, to start an interview show, people thought I was nuts and I didn't care what anybody thought. So I'm with her. And now, look at you now, look at you now, look what you're doing and look how great it turned out. I mean, I what, if you had, what if you had cared, you know? What if you had cared? I mean, I'm, I write about this on social media all the time, you know, that we have got to live our lives as we see fit, not as others see fit. And you know, listen to the opinions of the, of your loved ones, but you don't necessarily have to heed their advice if it doesn't ring true for you. Don't get pushed into into. Well, thank goodness you didn't stay where you were. You you probably would not be happy today, you know. And how much happier are you today that you followed your 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 bliss and and you did what your heart told you to do? That's just great. Good for you, man. I, I think that's. That's a great story right there. You should write a book. 
<laughs> Maybe one day I will. Well, I'm into that. You know, Randy, when you look at all the tragedy and turmoil in her life, I mean, she lost two babies. Her marriage to JFK was problematic. Her husband was assassinated right next to her. She had loads of family drama all around her. Her relationships with men, with maybe the exceptions of Jack Wernicke and Morris Templesman, were tumultuous. And of course, she lived most of her life under the scrutiny of the public eye. My question to you is this. Do you think that ultimately Jackie found at least some contentment in her life? I do. I, I, I think that, you know, she had many moments of contentment, but she's quoted in the book as saying, and I think she said it to Jack Warnicky, that whenever she felt really, truly happy, she could see herself looking down upon her and, and feeling like she didn't deserve to be happy oh. because, because she felt like JFK should, should be grieved. And that every time she was happy, it was a betrayal of her grief for her husband. You know, I think that she had such survivor's guilt for her entire life tied into her PTSD that whenever she felt like she was happy, she she felt like, wait a second, I shouldn't be happy. Look what happened. To, look what happened to Jack. How can I be happy? And I think that's that's what PTSD is. You know, it's it's not allowing yourself to live your life because you are living in the shadow of tragedy. And I think that she had moments of contentment. And I think there are many in the book, you know, where you feel like, okay, she's, you know, she's happy, especially toward the end of, of her life. But I don't know that she, I don't know that she was ever by her own admission. She was never able to get past the assassination so she was never able to sort of like just be truly happy. Well, now, as you know, Randy, over the years, Jackie has been portrayed in movies and TV shows by no less than 19 actresses, by my count. Jacqueline wow. Smith, Jacqueline Bissett, Natalie Portman, Katie Holmes, many, many more. Do you have a favorite portrayal that is the most authentic based on your research and on the woman you met back in 1983? Yes, I, I, well, I, I think that the two Jackies in both of my shows, in Jackie Ethel Joan, Jackie was played by Jill Hennessy, and in After Camelot, Jackie was played by Katie Holmes. Those are as close as I can imagine, and I had so many surreal moments. Uh, you know, it, with 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 Jill Hennessy walking along the beach with her as Jackie in character as Jackie in costume. And she and I are walking on a beach, which was supposed to be high, high end sport. And I looked and there was Joe and Rose's home, which we had constructed the big, the big house. And I'm looking and there's the big house and I'm standing next to a woman who looks exactly like Jackie. And I'm like, my mind is blown right now. And on the very first day of filming of after Camelot, 20 years later, there's Katie Holmes. And she's dressed as Jackie and she looks like Jackie. And the first scene we did of After Camelot was of Jackie as an editor at Viking Press. And this was kind of maybe 10 years before I knew Jackie, but she looked like the Jackie that I knew. And when she walked onto the set, oh my gosh, it was Jackie. So much so that I asked, I asked one of the executive producers, who is my producing partner, Carrie Seelig, could you please take a picture of me and Katie? And, you know, you don't ask for that on set. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I'm, I was an executive producer and I wrote the book and here I am, like, suddenly I'm this fanboy who wants a picture with, you know, <laughs> with Katie Holmes, with Jackie. And, but Katie was great and she, you know, she took the shot and I have the shot in my office right now. And when you look at that picture of me with this woman who I love, Katie, so much and she looks just like Jackie you know so to answer your question my favorite Jackies are the two Jackies in my shows and I'm getting ready to do another Jackie because I'm doing the TV version of Jackie Public Private Secret which is going to be a series and I don't know who that who that Jackie is going to be but wow I can't wait to see who we cast in that role 
I feel like I wanted to be an unknown actress. I would love for it to be somebody that we could discover who can then bring, you know, something brand new to, to that character. Leave it to you. It'll happen. And then I'm going to be knocking on your door, asking you to come back to the show to promote that new miniseries. Yes. Yes. And I'll be here too. Cause I love, I love you and I love doing your show. Anytime you, anytime you have like an opening and you're like, gosh, you know, we don't have guests, you know, call me. I'm oh. always going to be. God, you just made my day. I want to tell our viewers that you can find out more about J. Randy Terraborelli and his books by going to his official website, jrandyterraborelli.com. Well, Randy, I have only one more question for you. What do you think Jackie would have thought of your book? That's such a good question. I, you know, she was an editor at Doubleday when I was a young writer at Doubleday. She told me one thing that really stuck with me because my first book about Diana Ross was like every story that you can ever imagine about Diana Ross. It was way, way, way too long. And she said to me, she said, there are many stories in the big city. You have to find your story and tell it well. And I think that with this book, I did that. You know, I found the story that I wanted to tell and I hope I told it well. And even though it was about her, I think that she... I just think she'd approve. I do. I really do. So do I. I never knew her, but I do too. I got to tell you, I'm so proud of what you've achieved. This is the fastest selling book in America this week. Congratulations, Randy. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate it, Harvey. I love being on your show. And thanks for having me back. Well, your books never disappoint. Neither do you when you give an interview. Thank you for all the books you've written. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Randy. My pleasure. My pleasure. We'll see you soon. Our guest has been the mega popular New York Times bestselling author, J. Randy Terraborelli, whose latest book, Jackie, Public, Private, Secret, is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.